Welcome to End of Life University on YouTube. Today, I'm sharing with you a conversation I had with Johanna Lunn, who is a filmmaker currently residing in Canada. She's made a trilogy of documentary films called When You Die, and her website is whenyoudie.org. I know you're going to really enjoy learning about the films and about the website and the work that she's doing, so stay tuned for that. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe down below to this channel, and also subscribe and leave a rating and review for the podcast wherever you happen to listen and go to eoluniversity.com slash support if you're able and willing to make a small contribution that will help keep this channel and the podcast on the air. So we'll move on now with my conversation with Johanna Lund. Today, I'm so happy to welcome my guest, Johanna Lunn, who is an award-winning producer, direct, director, and writer who has crafted thought-provoking programs during her 20 years in the business. She has won three Gemini Awards, which is the Canadian equivalent of an Emmy, and has had 11 different nominations. Is that Oh no, eight, sorry, and has had eight <laughs> nominations for the Gemini Award. In addition to producing more than 150 hours of television series and one-offs as an in-house executive producer, she has made independent documentaries for her own companies, Wild East Productions and Center East Media, and won Best Documentary at Hot Docs International Film Festival for her moving and timely film, forgiveness stories for our time. And I'd, I'd love to discuss that sometime in the future, because that sounds amazing as well. She is also the director and producer of the When You Die documentary trilogy, which we'll be discussing today. And you can learn more about Johanna's work on the When You Die project at whenyoudie.org. So Johanna, welcome and thank you so much for joining me today. No, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to have this conversation. Well, I've spent some time watching the films, the, the When You Die trilogy, and it's absolutely amazing. I was so moved and touched by it. And so I've been really excited ever since I watched them to be able to talk with you about it. But I thought maybe we'd start by having you just share a little bit more of your story, because not every filmmaker is drawn to make films that talk about when you die. And so I'd love to hear kind of what brought you to this place. Um, it's a long story. I'll try not to make it too long, though. <laughs> um, I should say it's long in terms of the history of its its origins, really. Um, it really comes from my own very complex grief journey at a young age. Um, so when I was 19, my mother died. And then in a three year period, my mother, my best friend growing up and um, an old dairy farmer died in my arms. Mm. Also three really unexpected, shocking deaths in a very short period of time. And at a time when death was truly, truly, truly taboo. Uh, and to be in a grief state was really to be an outcast. You know, people had no idea what to do with me. And my grief was just compounded and compounded again, you know, and then compounded again in such a short period of time. And at such a young age that it was very difficult for me to integrate, especially since no one wanted to talk to me. <laughs> and I didn't know how to interact with the world at all either. So it was a very confusing time. And I was in college and that was also made it even more confusing because it's at a time when you're really moving from childhood into some kind of adulthood and all of those things. And uh, so it was a very difficult, difficult period for me. And my first job out of college um, was uh, working as a research assistant for a project that PBS wanted to see a proposal for. Um, at this time, I was living in the U.S. And um, it was on death and dying in the context of community. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's work was extremely well known at that time. Stephen Levine and his wife's work was definitely out there. 
and um, the AIDS uh, epidemic was happening, but not really publicized. So hospices were really starting. And I had a chance to interview a lot of really, really amazing people. And it was definitely helpful for me to start seeing a healthy way of integrating all of the trauma that I experienced at a young age. Um, we put together a proposal. Uh, it was um, amazing by PBS's account. They said, we've never seen anything like this. This is really important information, but they said, it's really still too taboo. We don't feel like we can touch this right now. And so that was the beginning of my career. Mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, always thought it was too bad, but you know, moved on and did other things and was, you know, I had a, a career. I moved to Canada where most of my adult life has been spent here um, and working in film and television. Um, and I, so I had many roles working in television, programming film festivals, you know, and then I started my own uh, production company and did a number of films. And then I reached a point uh, where I'd finished one and my business partner and I looked at each other and was like, well, what's next? And I'm the creative one, you know, and, and uh, I'm like, well, you know, we could do this or we could do this or, you know, no, none of it was landing. And um, I also have a, a mentor who's been very, very helpful to me throughout my career. And she sat with me for a while and went through my list. And she said, I know you have something else. I said, well, there's this project that never got made. It was around death and dying. And she said, that's it. That's what you have to do. So um, I thought, OK, I really committed to doing it. But as someone who's worked in television, I know that when you pitch a project to a broadcaster or a major funder, they really want to have control over the story for the most part. They really want to have a hand in it. And at that point, I didn't really know what the story was. I wanted to research widely and talk to a lot of people because I felt that I didn't know that I didn't really know this thing about death and dying. What is it in community? What happens to people? What happens to your mind? So the whole thing, you know, your emotional state, your spiritual state, your physical state, the community and family around you, I didn't know. And so um, I, I did it the hard way. I didn't get the funding for it up front. I did, it, I did just the opposite of how you're supposed to make movies. You're supposed supposed to come in, know what you're shooting, and then coax people into saying what you want them to say. And I didn't do it that way at all. So that meant that over a long period of time, I was filming interviews based on where our other paying gigs took us. So if I was going to London, England, it would be like, well, who's in England or any country nearby that I want to talk to? <laughs> You know, or if I'm on the West Coast, who is out here? Because I would have a whole crew with me that I, you know, would not have to cover the travel expenses or hotels for, you know, I could just pay them a little bit for the shoot. Although just about everybody unanimously did it for free because everyone was behind this project on my team. And so that is how it started getting cobbled together. And I um, did, did a lot of research. So I had like big binders full of, you know, people I would love to interview. I mean, like over a hundred people. Wow. <laughs> so obviously that wasn't going to happen. Um, and at, once we got up to about the, the number 19 interview, my business partner said to me, I think we have to make the movie now. You know, and in the meantime, I'd started a website because I had all this resource information and I wanted people to have access to it um, because I thought it was important. And I was like, oh, no, we need just a couple more, a couple more. And then COVID hit. And it was like, OK, we have to edit these films. We've got to really do this now. And I had already been sort of rough editing and knew what I had. And uh, but it was really clear that it wasn't one movie. I mean, normally um, an independent documentary would be maybe three years. You know, you research it, you shoot it, you edit it, you get it out in the world, and then you're on to the next one. Well, this has really been a 10-year project. 
Um, and we're only just now launching the third in what became a trilogy of, of films. So it was really a project born out of my own personal grief journey and out of an intense love and desire for all of us to understand this incredibly important passage of a human life. What's it about? Wow. Um, That's where it comes it's a great story. Well, I love on the one hand that it was like a side project for, for a while to do the interviews, but it seemed like it was all somehow perfectly orchestrated. The right people were happened to be wherever you were traveling because you, you captured such wonderful speakers. But then it also occurs to me how those of us who have experienced or dealt with death and dying and grief we understand what a treasure this information is, this wisdom and this knowledge. And yet you have to go up against people in the outside world who don't know that, who are telling you, oh no, that would never be a good subject. And, oh no, that's not, that's, that wouldn't be the right direction to go. Cause I, that happens in publishing or used to all the time for authors as well, just getting shut down because the people who run those businesses and industries haven't had their own experience and don't understand how valuable the information is. That's a, that's so true. And I think the other side of it too, is often if you're a publisher or you're a broadcaster or a programmer of one of the streams, you're always looking in the rear view mirror for what was working. Where were you getting your biggest audiences or sales or whatever? And it never works that way because we are never going backwards as a society and a culture. We're going forward. So it's it's a brave person who would commission a film on death and dying um, because there isn't a lot of success stories. Yeah, so very true. Yeah, if yeah. we look backwards, all we see is the taboo and the stigma around talking about death. But that perspective just continues to foster the the taboo and our, our lack of discussion about it. So, so I applaud your bravery to, to step forward and um, create this project. Well, thank you. It definitely took a little village and, you know, a, a, a great business partner who just, you know, rooted me on. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that everywhere I went, I was encouraged. You know, I think I think that when I started, um, there wasn't it was a, way ahead of its time. And at, at this point, I feel like the film's are really in the right time, in the right place. I think if I'd finished it eight years ago or even seven years ago, that it would probably not go as far. There wouldn't be as much interest. But I think we've been through and are going through a lot as a culture right now, like enormous losses. You know, if, if COVID didn't, you know, bring up the subject of death and dying, um, the environment does, the economy does. The, I mean, there's so many grief streams that are happening right now and losses that um, it's interesting to me how many people in their 30s and 40s are really interested in this subject right now. Um, whereas you would never have thought that age group was was a prime target target for death and it'd be like well 55 up you know maybe more like 60 mm -hmm. you know but 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 not not younger people who are really entering into their careers and beginning um really to make their mark in, in a lot of ways so i think i think we're just in a time right now where we really need this conversation and we really need to understand what it means to be human it's so true and i i personally personally feel that we really need media, we need films and documentaries that teach people because I think it gives such great access to this information to such a big group of people who, you know, who low cost can watch a film, you know, they can come with all their questions and doubts and fears and sit and watch a film and be transformed by it over the period mm. of an hour or so. And I think that's really powerful. 
I, yeah, I think it's really great when people can watch films together and have conversations. And that certainly was forefront in my mind, making these these films, which maybe I should say a little bit about what the, the trilogy, what the films are. Yes. Um, the, the first one uh, is In the Realm of Death and Dreaming. And it really explores the question of does consciousness continue after death or is it lights out? You know, what what are personal stories of things like near death experiences or deathbed in uh, experiences, uh, visitations, dreams, all those things. Um, what some of the science has to say right now around consciousness studies, because in the scientific community, this is a big emerging field. I mean, it's been gaining a lot of momentum over the last decade and they're going places with this, this question. But I will say on the science side, there is no definitive proof that consciousness ends at death and there is no definitive proof that it continues. So the thing I love about that is it remains a great mystery so we can all kind of wade around in it. Um, and so this film is really exploring that territory. I never in any of these films or anywhere in the One You Die project tell people what to think. I really try to give people different things to think about and to ask and to reflect on in their own life and with their own set of values. Um, because there isn't a definitive answer. It's more what it feels right for you. So if you don't believe that consciousness continues, there is nothing wrong with that point of view. Um, it means that right now is the most important moment in our life, which quite frankly is where our attention should be right now. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I still think people should consider what they want when they die. And I think that question about what happens when we die and does consciousness continue helps to inform us what we might want as we, you know, if we get a, um, a prognosis, a terminal prognosis, or we're aging out, what, what, what's going on there? What would you like um, as you're going through that process? So that's the first film. The second film, uh, Saying Goodbye, Preparing for Death. It's a lot about how to talk about death, how to have the conversation. Um, there's, there are certain, you know, things thrown in there that you might not have thought about, you know, what you might want as you're, as you're dying or preparing for your death. Um, so just, you know, again, it's not a definite, none of these are definitive. They really, really meant to, in a way, almost walk away with more questions than you ever knew you had about death and dying. So um, the, the second film is really opening up that conversation, uh, and I hope in a loving way, in a, in a kind way, in a gentle way, um, and to alleviate fear. All three films are really address the issue of fear and how we can make friends with this short life, you know, um, and death. So um, then the third film is the architecture of death, the inner world of dying. And that really is the spiritual, emotional, and physical, what happens when you die in the um, weeks and days and moments leading up to death and a little bit after. Um, so that's, that's the trilogy. Um, and I, uh, yeah, anyway, that's where we're at with the trilogy. <laughs> It's, re it's really beautiful, and I love the way that, that you've divided it into these three different sub subject matters, really, because I think that's a great way to approach death and dying anyway, and uh, sometimes we have to think about different aspects of it because it's a little too much for us to grasp all of it at once. And, um, and I did want to say the speakers that you've interviewed, all of them have such a calming presence and uh, that comes through loud and clear and so I think the films indeed really do help with fear it really helps you contemplate things that that to the mind are frightening and yet you have guides through it talking you through it and talking about ways to look at it that really alleviate the fear 
Yeah, I really feel very fortunate to have talked to so many amazing people. Um, each person who's featured in these films is uh, deeply, deeply steeped in their disciplines, you know, and they're wise, you know, they're boots on the ground, wise people. And that's another thing I think um, a lot of uh, people would say, well, did you follow someone who was dying during the course of your filming? And it's like, no, I, I didn't. I actually did not want to do that. There are um, many very beautiful films that do that. And they're so, so helpful. But I really wanted to talk to people who have spent their careers exploring what happens when you die and being at the bedside and, um, you know, real, real seasoned people that had a lot of um, knowledge that they were very, very happy to share and share generously. Yeah, when there was a, a line from the film, and I'm not sure who said it, I think it was from the third one um, that I wrote down to remember the ego and mind don't know how to die, but the body does. And that really, that's why we need this kind of training for the mind and the ego, which become the obstacles to having a peaceful death and peace of mind and quality of life because it's our mind and ego that needs the training. The body already knows how to die and will die. That will happen for us. We just want to remove the obstacles that the mind creates um, that cause us to fear death and dying. I loved that too. That, that was uh, Amri Chasson. And uh, that I just, I agree with you. I, I thought it was a real game changer to say it like that because um I was, you know, I'd been going along knowing that, learning about how the body knows how to die. And, and, and she just was so brilliant to say, well, yeah, of course the body does know how, but here's where the problem is. And it is, it really is the fear issue. It, it, it because we don't know what we don't know, right? I mean, um, Andrew Holacek said that quite beautifully, that um, we are most afraid of the thing that we don't know and we don't know about death um and i i think that that's that that's really true that you kind of have to calm down your nervous system you know which the ego really has a grip on you know the fight or flight thing and and if you can reason with that and feel safe and say hey you know you got this your you know your body knows how to do this it's natural to it and that the more you try to intervene with well-meaning intention, the more suffering you're going to have. And I thought that was really an amazing um, discovery for, for me. That was a real discovery. I didn't, I didn't fully, I, I kind of sensed that it will, we've been dying for centuries, you know. Um, <laughs> so we, our bodies must know how to do it. Uh, <laughs> But I, I hadn't realized how much um, we're really at this crossroad in healthcare, where, you know, and again, this is a point I really try to make in the films, where there's um, a time when the time for curing is done, the time for healing, which is a very different kind of work, begins, and it's a different team. You know, so it takes the pressure off of doctors who are fabulous clinicians, technicians, and they know all the kind of plumbing stuff to do. But at a certain point, that isn't helpful anymore. And it can actually rob time from someone who's dying that they could spend in a totally different way. You know, and, and that it would be a different way for every human being. You know, it might be just eating ice cream or spending more time with your family or having people drive you like we did with my father in the autumn. It was a, the October when he died and his, his, he wanted to drive into the mountains and see the, the leaves turning. And that was a huge gift to him. But if we would kept him in the hospital, that would not have been possible. You know, so knowing that there is another team and we're also at this time where that other team is really developing you know that 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 you know it's not just hospices but i mean palliative care has become such a sophisticated field people shouldn't die in pain we have knowledge that can really help with that you know just like um 
uh, there are people that are trained in helping making meaning at end of life and going through your life. What a gift that is to have someone skilled to do that. Because left to our own devices, a lot of us wouldn't know how to make sense of it all, you know, but with a nice guide who can help us making meaning and recognizing this has been a rich life, you know, it's sort of like covering all the bases of, of not feeling, um, working through whatever guilt or, or unresolved stuff. We could do that. That's why it's a healing time, you know, and, and I, um, again, it, it was really uh, Amory Chasson who talked about, you know, wouldn't it be great if we called it, you know, I'm going to go into my healing period now. Wow. You know, I, mean, I it's love, like, love that. And I love the idea that it's a, it's another team. We need to bring in a new team when we shift our, shift the direction of our focus from trying to cure something to that healing phase. And like you said, instead of, of berating all the physicians who trained in order to focus on curing, let them do what they do. They're good at that. And yeah. let's not try to remake them and ask them to also be the healing team, because that just may not be that, that just may not be part of their skill set. And we have all these people ready and willing to be on the healing team. So let's just get more comfortable shifting from from one team to the other and knowing when it's the right time for that. Yeah, and I think doing it with a lot of gratitude too, because you know our our curing team they work so hard, you know, and and I think that we're more broadly aware now the kind of strain that the healthcare system is under, and how understaffed people are, and the demand is growing, and all of that. And I think we we really need to have a lot more compassion for our healthcare providers. Yeah. Yeah, that's so very true. And in fact, our healthcare providers actually benefit when there's the healing team around. I was reading a study about that, that when a palliative care team comes into a hospital environment, it actually helps the mental and emotional health of all the staff in the hospital because of just that the mindset and because there are people holding space that healing is possible and we know how we know what it takes and what to do to help move in that direction and i think it just adds an element to the the care being offered there that wasn't there before in the past oh i love that it that makes so much sense to me yeah because all of us all of us need that healing approach and it's just because medicine has left it out for such a long time that Healthcare providers don't even know how to do that for themselves. Oh yeah. Well, yes. I I mean I think that's a huge a huge area too, right? That um, it's to my knowledge, and I know you probably know so much more about this, but I don't think that self care is really taught in medical school. No. Um, it, in fact, when I went through medical school, it's almost like. Um, uh, how do I say it? You get awarded points for how little sleep you can get by on, you know? Oh, yeah. if you're the person who, yeah. who didn't sleep for 36 hours, but kept going and worked really hard, you, you know, you, you go up in status in other, in other people's minds and never stopping to think like, that's horrible. That <laughs> that's so destructive. And we're not even, we're, we're praising people for that instead of offering to help them out or, or, or offering suggestions for here's something you might need to preserve your own health. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, I think the more widely that people understand all of these things that we're talking about, that it will create change. You know, people often say, well, how, how are you going to change things? How are you going to change things? And it's really one person at a time. But but you can reach a lot of people, you know. You can really reach a lot of people, the work that you're doing. And so many other people who are in death education, it's it's we need to reach a broader audience so that they can, can you know, know that they should ask their doctor, are they okay? You know, <laughs> or, <Yeah. laughs> you know, are you okay? <laughs> Have you had enough sleep? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, do you like um, sushi? I don't know. <laughs> have your films been, do you know if they're being used at all in medical training institutions? Yeah, that's really a big target audience for me. And um, now that the third film is about to be released, so the first two are out and people can watch them on our website, whenyoudie.org. Um, very inexpensive rental, available to everyone. Uh, the third one, it's interesting because this one has actually been ready for quite a while. I mean, not a whole year, but a pretty long time. And I'm really glad that I held it back. I did some sneak preview screenings um, among some medical people. I did a big conference, uh, the International Conference on University Educators Who Teach Death and Culture. That was a really big audience. Um, and But I held it back. I wasn't ready to release it. And everybody on my team was like what is wrong with you like let's get it out there it's done it's ready it's you know blah 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 but, but I don't know why I didn't I mean it, I didn't do anything in a normal way with this project so I don't know why I should start now my my intuition really said no and then I realized it, you know the time is now right I so at the end of February uh we'll be releasing the film and we'll have a big um release event on the 24th um and I'm really looking forward to that. So this third film is, has been ready, but not ready. And so now that, that all three will be ready, we can really start selling, you know, we've already sold individually to university medical schools and also in the sociology departments for death and culture kind of issues. Um, uh, a lot of hospices are picking it up for their staff as well as for their families. Uh, which is really, really great. Um, we are getting interest in bereavement groups, smaller ARP groups in the U.S. Uh, American Association of Retired Persons have a number of chapters, uh, state chapters, and they're doing movie nights, which is helpful for their constituents. And uh, so we are definitely doing that. But now with the third one, we will do a much more concerted sort of push to sell them all together. Um, I mean, they certainly each one stands alone, but I I don't know, and I'd love your thought on this, but I, I feel like they were meant to all come together. Yeah, I was going to say that very thing that, it, you know, watching them, each one does stand alone, but looking back on the the whole of all three, you're right, they each cover something different, and it's all essential, all really important. So I love the idea of the trilogy, but also I, I love the idea of a movie night because since each film, are they each around an hour? That's what it seemed to me about an hour long, which is yeah. perfect because you can show the film and then have a, dis there's time to have a discussion afterwards and they're very thought provoking. And so I would imagine that really rich conversations take place with, from people who have, have watched one of the films. Yeah, I, I mean, I did that on purpose, making them under an hour, because I really wanted, to me, all the films I've ever made, having conversations about what you think, what these subjects are about, to me, that's the most generative possible biggest gift to me as a filmmaker is when people can say, you know, we watched these, then we talked for two hours and you go, wow, that is so great. You know, <laughs> please <It's>, share it. <laughs> yeah. It's fantastic. Like I could even see it for a family movie night, you know, when you get all your extended family together and everyone watches one of the films and that leads into even a discussion of our own end of life plans and and what we're thinking. But I was wondering, do you have any kind of like uh, facilitators guides or anything that might go with the movies if someone did want to do use it in that way? Oh yeah, absolutely. Each film does have uh, a guide that goes with it. And it's everything from how to set up an event to screen, questions, how to advertise uh, posters, all of that stuff. So it, it's a complete package, but particularly, I think, um, I mean, and, and people have found all of those things helpful. Um, even though we have a list of, of questions for each film to generate conversation, I'm not sure anyone's ever had to use that list. 
<laughs> but all the how to's and back more background on the the speakers who are in the films and a um, little more background on you know why these films were made and and all of and all of that. So I know that the um, the guides are very very helpful. Yeah, I'm I'm sure they are. And I wanted to say I trust your intuition about the timing because it seems like this whole project, as you said, it's kind of been uh, it's kind of come together in this sort of magical divine way, and that. I think it's really important to wait for the right timing because as you saw that initial project back in the past didn't fly because it wasn't time yet. And so I, so yeah, I trust whatever, whatever intuitive guidance you've had, I think is probably just right. But I would love to see every community have a, a film night or, or as part of some sort of festival going on in the community a film night and show these films because they're, um, they're, what do we want to say? They're very approachable for the average person. It seems to me in terms of, you don't have to already know very anything about death and dying and you don't have to know medical terms or jargon and you can come in as someone, you know, completely uninformed in a way about end of life situations and still get so much out of the films. Yeah, that that's 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 great. I really had that audience in mind making them. That um, it's not for the you know highly educated end of life person. Um, it's it's for my brothers, you know, who uh, don't know anything and don't really want to talk about it. But of course, I've forced them to. Of course. <laughs> 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 but they still have their own opinions and they have their own, you know, but uh, yeah, I wanted it to be really um, uh, approachable. Yeah, that's, that's a good word for it, because they definitely are. So I'm saying it because I want to encourage people listening, like, if you're trying to think of something you could do in your community to foster more conversations about the end of life, like this film series would be a fantastic thing to offer. And so how would one go about if they wanted, say, to do a, you know, a neighborhood film series, how do they go about accessing each one of the films to do that? Mm -hmm. um, on our website, I think that um, you'll see uh, people who want to do that can reach out to, I believe it's programs at when you die.org. We'll give you all the help and whatever that you need. I mean, we definitely are there to help people do exactly this. Mm. Oh, that's perfect. So, you know, it's a, if someone just has the inspiration to do it, they can get all the guidance they need from you. So it shouldn't be that much that they, them, you know, that they have to take on that they, without without knowing how to do it, they can find no, everything that's right. they need from That's you. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A to I, Z, we got your back. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to see that happen because we're at the point right now and we're training lots of death doulas and we're, we're, you know, we're developing lots of tools and resources and we have lots of people out there who want to help. But if we don't educate the masses, we won't have enough people ready yet to utilize the services. And so that's where I feel like that's our, our step right now. We've got to keep educating the general public and helping them get over their fear as, as these films do so that they could actually talk to someone about, about moving into that healing phase. Yeah, that's, that's, that's well said. I support that. <laughs> yeah. So in, in my opinion, the films are coming out at exactly the right time when, when they could make a really big impact in our communities. Um, I, I know the website, you have a website that offers other things. You have podcasts and um, a place for stories. And so I would just, I wanted you to talk a little bit about that as well. Sure. Um, well, I think, as I mentioned that in the beginning, as I was researching and um, learning, I mean, I'm still learning, there's so much to learn. Um, I, I was putting things up on a website. So that's a lot of things that are in our resource section on the website. And there are a lot of resources there. Uh, and I always welcome people who if they have 
other things that should be there in those resource pages to please, please let us know because we will just add them because that's that's what we want to do. Um, they're not so much country or um, province or state specific. Uh, it, it tends to be more um, broad than that. Because if we start to get into, um, you know, wills and medical directives for every state in the United States, every province in Canada, every province in Australia, every, you know, it, it gets to be, that's not our job. But there's tons and tons of other kinds of, you know, books and other organizations and all kinds of stuff. Um, there are uh, stories. Um, uh, some of these are just um, uh, things that have been in other publications that we've reprinted or pointed to. Uh, and again, there are just more and more and more wonderful, interesting, provocative, provocative stories that are, we're, that are getting out into the public. So uh, we do welcome ideas around that as well. Um, and the podcasts are there. We, we also have a YouTube channel that really just got up over... Christmas that uh, has all of our podcasts and some other shorts and extras. There are also other uh, shorts videos that are on our website as well. Um, there's just a lot of stuff there. You could spend a couple days. Yeah. So... Or if you've only got five minutes, just, just to, to, to peruse it a little bit. Yeah, it's worth visiting because you can scroll through those stories and you'll see the title of one and think, oh, that's exactly what I need to read today, that that particular story. So it's it, it's a very helpful website. So I encourage people to go there. And then I wanted to ask you a little more personally in the process of doing these films, what what have you learned? Did you find answers to some of your own questions or um, healing for your own grief. I'm just curious about how that process has been for you. Mm. Um, yeah, well, I, I don't think that at this point I was carrying a lot of, um, grief, you know, uh, un, unprocessed grief when I started this project 10 years ago, I had worked through a lot of, an awful lot of stuff. Um, but I think that, you know, there's there's so many facets to immersing myself in, you know, all things end of life. Um, one thing definitely happened was that I am not afraid of dying. I'm I don't want to leave, and I think that leaving is hard because I love so many people, you know, my own family and so on. So I know that the leaving part is hard but I'm not afraid of death. I truly am not. So that, that certainly is a big gift. And also I think I got a huge gift in discovering that people um, have extraordinary uh, perception, um, sense perception abilities that we just don't use, you know, because at end of life, all kinds of things, you know, as your consciousness begins to expand and sort of detach from the body, um, you're much more sensitive to all types of, of experiences. And, and if your loved ones are also sensitive, then you get into things like premonitions of your loved one dying. You know, I had that experience when I was very young of my great aunt. I knew the moment she died. I don't know how I knew that, but I, I did. I knew it. Um, and that that's a very common thing, or um, that people who are dying have deathbed visitations, or that shared death experiences happen, you know, and this is where people um, who are not dying journey with the person who's dying as they are leaving their body, as they are, are leaving, passing on to something else. So there, there's a huge range of um, perceptual abilities that humans have. And it's not just around death. I mean, we've all heard of, you know, mystical experiences, spiritually transformative experiences. And those seem to be the very rare spiritual masters, the Thomas Mertens, the, you know, that the, these great yogis have these experiences. But, you know, I also discovered 
that that happens to housewives in Kansas. And you know, very, very common things will happen to people that we don't talk about. And I think that once you get into the end of life, you know, exploration, you discover that people have out of body experiences. And, you know, football players have out of body experiences when they're whacked at full speed in the middle of a tackle. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? Because these are like the people you would least expect to have an out of body experience. And yet, you know, a lot of athletes in rough and tumble sports do experience that. So I, I just made me realize that there is a whole range of, you know, we could call them spiritual experiences, but I think they have to do with our sense perceptions, these things that we haven't truly um, explored very much, you know, um, it's kind of in the realm of yogis and mystics, but actually it turns out to be far more ordinary. And, and I think that was the other thing that um, all of these deathbed experiences and um, sensitivities and moments with your loved one that are heightened presence of now, that, that these are very, very common and very human and very ordinary. And so to me, discovering that, that there's so much more to being a person, to being a human, this was like the biggest gift on, on the entire world to, to go, wow, we really are special. Every yeah. one of us. Yeah, those stories were so inspiring, hearing those stories and hearing what's possible. And as you said, possible for anyone. Uh, and even sometimes for people who'd never had never explored spirituality, never had anything close to a, to a spiritual experience any other time in their lives. And yet we're having these um, um, amazing, phenomenal experiences at the very end of life. And it comes from that, what you alluded to at the beginning, the mystery, we still don't know. We don't know, does con con consciousness persist after we die or not? We don't know, but there's this, there's a mystery surrounding the last moments of life and what happens after death. And there's just so much, there's just so much for each one of us to learn and to see within it. And it's really beautiful. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's one of the things that you're the films explore so well, the mystery of it without, as you said, not leading anyone to any kind of answer, only leaving it there as a mystery that each one of us in our own way on our own journey will will delve into that mystery ourselves yeah yeah and you know i think the ordinariness of it is important too um that you don't have to be an extraordinary anything that could be your hairdresser could be person selling you groceries you know it, it, that it's just part of our humanity. Yes, yes, exactly. And so, yeah, not not special, not reserved for any any one group of people or another. Something that's there for for everyone. And um, yeah, it's it's a it's really beautiful. I did really enjoy hearing the stories that everyone shared about people they had worked with. Yeah, me too. Uh, and I, um, I would say, I guess I was in the very beginning, I was somewhat surprised by how common, you know, these stories of, you know, deathbed visitations or dreams. So someone's dying and their dead uncle Harry comes and is, is talking to them and no one else in the room can see it, but the person who's dying it, it can you know, and, and that these events, like deathbed dreams, are incredibly helpful for the person who's dying. And I guess, you know, part of my desire to, to make these stories uh, ordinary is that instead of saying to your loved one, oh, no, 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 that's just a hallucination, then you're negating something that's incredibly important to this person at this time, at the very end of their life. 
So even if you just think it's not true or a hallucination, why don't you say, what did Uncle Harry say? <laughs> or was it a good visit? <laughs> exactly. You just know? be curious. And... Yeah, mm -hmm. and that validate it just validate it it doesn't take much and i think sometimes that people negate these experiences because they're afraid of them that it seems too far out there which is why i think that i i like to come back to the fact that it's ordinary and common to have these experiences so so that we can be comfortable with them and to get curious about them too um because when people are dying we need to validate their experience we we we're not there to have you know the last argument <laughs> yeah so true and and there may be people who don't even share their experiences because they themselves aren't sure it's oh is it okay like I, this is happening but but what will others think if i tell them this happened and they may keep just keep it to themselves so they may be so much more common than we even know yeah, I think that's really true. I think certainly for my parents' generation, um, they did not talk about these things. Um, although for my grandmother, who was born in the early 1890s, who uh, was born in the family homestead, 12 kids survived. I think my great-grandmother birthed a whole lot more than that. So a lot of babies died in that house. Um, and a lot of people grew old and died, like my great grandparents. And the house even had, well, it had a parlor because they didn't have living rooms yet. That was a later World War II, post World War II invention. Um, but in in the parlor was a little door down on the floor. And I sort of had the thought when I was younger that it was for wood you know, to easy way to put wood in the house. Um, but then I realized when I was a teenager, there's no wood stove here. Mm. And so I said to my grandmother, I said, Granny, what, what is that door for? And she said, oh, that's where the dead people go feet first. I was like, you mean it was built for that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was purpose built for death. The house had a door where the dead bodies left the house because in that Victorian period, um, you, dead people don't go out the front door. They That's a very not so good thing. So you could come in and out if you're alive, but when you die and you die in the house because people were born in the house and they died in the house, they had their own exit, their own door. Wow. And so I know in her generation, they knew the language of death. They knew about all of these things. It was ha happening right there. But somehow in that next generation, the, the, the modern generation that moved into, you know, the industrial world and, you know, really greening America and building great nations and saving the world and all of that, that in that generation, it was a real um, buck up. You know, you, you can't you can't be weak. It's all about material. The material world was really ushered in with that generation. So, you know, it it pushed away anything that was was soft or perceptual or you know regarded as a weakness. Emotional things were kind of put aside for this greater thing. And and then that, of course, coupled with the fact that. Certainly all the World War II vets, you know, had post-traumatic shock and they just wanted to drink everything away and forget about death and dying. And, you know, and that's where the living room came into play. So we don't have dead people in the house anymore and all that stuff. So I, I feel like my parents' generation definitely didn't talk about any of these things. And now the, the boomer generation is much more like, well, yeah, I saw so-and-so doing that. You know, they're much more willing to talk about it. And I think the generation after this, you know, my uh, my daughter and, and her family, that they'll, they'll, that it'll be more normal for them. It'll be a lot more normal. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I just, when you were describing that door in the, in your grandmother's house, you know, I, I had this thought of like, those old, old homes, how much death they have held, you know, the walls and the windows and the floors. I mean, those, 
those houses have been uh, kind of open arms in a way, wrapping around death and holding death in our modern homes. But well, many some many of them have had someone die in the home, but not in the same way as that as you know over decades and decades of time having many of the people who grew up and lived there also die within those walls. Yeah. Yeah. Very different relationship than we have now. Yeah. Yeah. That's really fascinating. Well, um, uh, it's, it's so much fun to talk to you. I feel like I could just keep talking and talking. I actually would love to sit down and watch each film with you and then have you do a narration over the film of well, and tell me the backstories of <laughs> of all the interviews and where you met that person, and I think that'd be really fascinating. <laughs> well, maybe sometime. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll do a narrated version of the films <laughs> someday down the road. <laughs> well, um, I'll remind listeners to go to whenyoudie.org to look up the films, but also. Um, the stories that are posted there and the podcasts and then to reach out. And I'm hoping people will feel inspired to have some sort of a film night or a film festival in their community or at least watch the films themselves. But they really are meant to be shared, I think, with a larger group of people because, well, my I watch them alone and then immediately I wish I had someone with me that I could just talk to about it. So share them with others. <laughs> And so, we're here to help if you do that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That I think that's very encouraging. It won't be that hard to put something together because you'll get resources and guidance to do it. Well, thanks again, Johanna, for coming and talking with me. I really appreciate it. It's really a pleasure, Karen. Thank, thank you so much. And I appreciate so much all that you're doing. Um, thank you very much. You're, you're so very welcome. It's my pleasure. And I love getting to meet people like you who are doing such good work in the world. So I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Joanna Lunn and also that you will go to whenyoudie.org and check out the three films in her project. They're absolutely fantastic. I think you'll really enjoy watching them and maybe even creating an event around showing them in your community. So until we're together next week with another interview, uh, take care and be well. Bye-bye. <laughs>